but it's gone. Okay, everybody, thank you. Welcome. Are we recording? Yes. This is Wednesday, February 28, 2024, Assembly Ethics and Elections Committee. We're meeting to uh, have a brief agenda and discuss the election that's upcoming. Do we need this mic on? There's nobody on the phone. Okay, we're, okay no, please. It causes problems. So, um, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, I guess we'll do introductions, actually. Let's go around that way. Mr. Gates, introduction. Dean Gates is from the council. Matthew here, legislative council. Scott Myers. Christopher Constant. Kevin Cross. William Northrop, acting elections administrator. James Hines, municipal clerk. And over uh, having lunch, because time is short, we have Jessica Willoughby. Super glad she's here. Not a microphone at this moment. And then we also have in the back, uh, Liz Edwards. Okay, so on the agenda, we have uh, one item. It's a briefing on a 2024 regular election update. Jamie. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start out with upcoming election dates. Uh, tomorrow we have logic and accuracy testing. And then on Sunday, the third is the last day to register to vote. Uh, ballot packages will be mailed to in-state and out-of-state uh, voters on Tuesday, March 12th. Uh, that's approximately 206,000, and then 900 military and overseas went out on Monday, the 26th, uh, to give them more time to get overseas. Um, the secure drop boxes will be deployed um, the first week of March, and then they'll be opened by Tuesday, the 12th. The vote centers open on March 25th. That is Seward's Day. Um, and they will be open through March 2nd, with the exception of, through April 2nd, with the exception of Sunday, which is Easter. Um, and then the Election Commission will be meeting on April 16th, and we need to update our calendar, which is online right now. Uh, at their last meeting, they couldn't meet on the 18th, so we need to adjust that to the 16th. Um, and then we'll be certifying the regular election on April 23rd. And then, if a runoff takes place, um, the ballot packages are required to be mailed by um, May 6th. We would be shooting for something more like April 30th. And then um, election day for a runoff would be May 14th. We would have the public session of Canvas on May 29th. And then we would ask for a special assembly meeting on Friday the 31st. Uh, to certify that election. So those are the upcoming dates. And then also we have two new uh, two new features this year for our election. Uh, the first one is ADA equipment will be available in the vote centers. Um, we are currently working on procedures for the election workers to set them up and then also to start a voting a voting situation for the voter. Um, we would uh, they open up the, the system and identify which ballot they want and then uh, the voter can, if they need audio or if they just need bigger font or if they need um, the reverse uh, black screen with white um, lettering. I think there's other options too. It'll read it to them, but I already say that. Um, anyway, for uh, anybody who doesn't have their own ADA equipment at their homes in order to vote. And then uh, it prints out a ballot, and then that ballot is stuck in the envelope, and the voter signs it, and it's run through the stream the same way as everything else, so there's still paper ballots for those. Um, that is the ADA equipment update, and then I'll let William take it over for the other um, Project, which is a pilot project for us this year. Yes, we are starting or we are piloting a program called Text Secure. Um, so we send out secure letters to folks who um, have some, some issue with their ballot. Um, this program will allow them to basically take a picture of their ID and send it back to us electronically through a text. 
Um, I have, if it's up and running now, if members would like to take it for a test run. Um, it's super convenient, pretty straightforward. Um, what do you guys think? Would you guys want to run it through a test, test run to see what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you want to take your phones out, and then you're going to want to text Anchorage to 28683. 28683, Anchorage. What's the number? It's 28683. Welcome. I just, mm, yep, you should get a link. Hold on one second. No, for the record, Ms. Brothers here. Go ahead. Okay. All right, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to click the Hear My Ballot button. And then when it comes to the voter signature affidavit page, you're going to want to enter 1111. That's our, one of our test pins. During the actual election, the voter will need their voter ID in order to get in. Four ones? Yep, four ones. Yep, so then there's two options. Um, if they receive the cure letter, uh, they click yes, I returned my ballot for the 2024 regular election. Um, and if they didn't actually return a ballot or vote a ballot, they can say no, I did not put a ballot. So if you click on yes and then hit submit, you'll then have to rotate your phone. And then there's a voter affidavit that they have to read and then sign. Oh. So a question on that, the voter affidavit that requires signature, it says using your full legal signature, so it's not your grocery store signature, it's the one that you believe is going to match in the voter record. So that's the idea. However, we are asking for the ID portion of it too. So we'll have that signature on their driver's license. So we'll upload a picture? Yes. Okay. So that's the next step. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'm sorry to get ahead of you. Yeah, I just imagine that there's, I mean, my signature changes significantly depending on what I'm writing with and what I'm writing on. I'm always amazed when I go to those to sign electronically with your finger, but that doesn't look anything like me. How do you do Yeah. So I'm glad to work with that. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's the same with me, and I always tell people that when I'm talking about signatures, because I got a cure letter once when I first moved here, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you want to just hit submit after that. It'll take you to the voter identification page where it then prompts you to take a picture of your ID. And then you would just take a click a photo. It should open up your phone uh, camera. Right now you can just take a picture of anything, doesn't matter. And it will upload it. <laughs> and then once it's uploaded. I'd like to note that um, Randy Salt is just doing this on the phone. Are you there, Mr. Salt? Okay, thanks. Maybe not. We'll see in a minute. Okay, and then once you've taken the photo of your ID, you hit submit, and then it will prompt you with the final page. Eventually. Service down here is pretty bad. Now, in mine, after I took my picture, it didn't show me what my picture was. Like, you couldn't say to make sure I took a piece of one. Does that make sense? It does, um, and that's a valid point. I can check in on that to see if there's an option. Because if there's a glare or yeah. something, you know what I mean? Or just making sure that the image I sent through. Yeah. Quickly, I'll note again, Mr. Salt, are you there on the phone? Yes, I'm here. All right, thanks, great. He's joined us. Go ahead. So I just wanted to point out that when you hit submit, it's going to a secure FTC site. It's not, that's just where it's going. It's not going some random place where everybody can access it. It's a secure FTC site where our staff has a username and password to log in and uh, we'll pull them off as soon as possible. And, and then we get paper copies and delete the electronic copies so they're not gonna be out there. Your ID isn't gonna be floating out there for a whole long time. Um, probably no more than three days if you submit it on a Friday at 8 p.m. We get it on Monday at, at 8.30 a.m. So. so 
So, um, do you count the submission from the moment it was sent or the moment it was received? Um, it doesn't really matter until we get to public session of Canvas. Um, and so the deadline is going that we're going to have to have received it by um, that hour. You know, it's uh, the public session of Canvas is at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock this year. Um, and so it's going to be like 10 o'clock on the 16th that we have to receive it by then in order to be able to cure things. And I, so it might be worth thinking maybe a little earlier even just because I could imagine a scenario where 300 people all at once, boom, 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 and there is no time between the one hour and the kickoff. So just a thought. I know you receive them in person right up until pretty close to the line. Thanks. Any questions? So that signature doesn't get added to the signature file for purposes of future verifications. Okay. And then um, what I will highlight, and I won't make everyone go back through, but when you when somebody indicates that they haven't voted a ballot, um, basically they'll just have to sign, and then it will say that if it will go to the commission for further review if we, for some reason, received a ballot that wasn't there, so they voted. So. That, that protects voters when they don't vote. Anything else? So that's the two areas we have innovating going this year. One is the ADA equipment, and one is the pilot text to cure. Mr. Cross. How many how many of the ADA um, monitors did we purchase? Five. We have one for each ADC, and then a fifth one in case of a failure that we can yeah. Anyone else? Anything uh, else? William's going to move on with some other training opportunities that we've dealt with, this, that well, dealt with some training situations that we have trained the election workers on this year. Yes, so just last week um, we had an election mail slash hazardous material training that was run by the uh, fire department and um, the FBI. They came down and did a quick training with um, the core team staff here, as well as some of the the chairs of each each area that we have, including the envelope opening. Um, just you know, to watch, what to watch out for, who to call in case of emergency. We've figured out you know if something does come in a ballot that is open, we have areas to secure people so we're going to move them into the back corner if they are um if they weren't exposed and then we'll if anyone's exposed we can put them in the kitchen until um firefighters and first responders come down um prior to that meeting uh three teams of firefighters came through and did a walkthrough um so they now know the layout of this building um we've also talked to apd about other issues such as swatting in case um a bomb threat is called directly to APD and not here, and what to do in those situations. Um, so I think that's I think that's it in regards to that material. Yeah. So those two situations are just um, what they've been talking about when we call into the election infrastructure ISAC meetings um, is is the uh, hazardous materials being sent in the mail and uh, the swatting have both been made their way to local elections and so we just took the opportunity to train uh the core team and the staff so that if it does make it here then we are prepared and i failed to mention that we did have a narcan training a month or so ago again from apd or um, firefighters um, so we do also have uh, hope kits on site just in case Will those be at all the ABCs? Yes, they'll be at the ABCs. They'll be here in the mail sorting, uh, the mail opening area, and we're going to have extra at the front. Others matters on that topic because I do have a kind of related but unrelated question. 
So if there's nothing I would ask the question of, you mentioned election workers. We haven't really had a briefing on the your um, level of staffing. Are we good? What's what's the standard right now? What's the need? And so what's a briefing? Well, <laughs> we thought we were good. Um, it, there's been a few who have donated to campaigns, and so we're addressing situations where they forgot that they are to be involved in campaigns and now we're going to have to hire a few more to replace folks who had done that. Are you confident we'll have the staff or do you need help pushing out messages that we need to hire folks? We, I think we have a couple interviews this week but we could certainly use help um, so specifically I, for ADC uh, folks and our workers. I so request. they don't need to be until the 19th when we do training for that. Um, and the second round too obviously. maybe. Yeah. I would request an email to all members with just a little brief, hey, we're seeking some additional help with the election center, so folks can share that out through their channels. Yeah, and I'll just share that this came to light on Monday, so. In a couple different places. Yeah. All right, anyone? Any? So yes, Brother, go ahead. So they can't have ever donated to a campaign or just related to the mayoral campaign? So the... Um, code in specific to the municipal clerk's office says that they can't we can't show partisanship at all and so we're prohibited and this is a step further than other municipal staff we're prohibited from participating in campaigning at all and so and so i i think that the interpretation is like specifically for that year right so um if they've donated to a campaign this for this what's on the ballot this year um, they can't participate as an employee in the election, and then, but if they don't donate next year for who's on the ballot next year, then then they can come back and work again. Thanks. And so, roughly, with APOC being what it is, that's an eighteen month period before election day. So count back eighteen months from election day. And that's the time. Other questions? Other matters? Uh, no. No. Okay, so on the agenda we have covered the one item of new business. Uh, no unfinished business is noted on the agenda. Any uh, member input or questions? Mr. Cross? I have a completely random question here. Is the whole brains for the election in this building right here? Is this like where we keep uh, all our servers and everything? Yeah. Okay, so when I was a fire protection contractor, you just got a wet pipe sprinkler system in here. And so if a head goes off, it could cause a lot of damage. They make a system called a double interlock system, which is it's compressed air, and you have to require a sprinkler head to go off, release air pressure, and a smoke detector. So it requires someone from coming in and smacking a sprinkler head and setting off the system inadvertently, or whenever you have, and that's typically used in data centers. And I would consider this a data center. And so just something to think about. I mean, for protection of the building, you have something to freeze up or something. Also, the system won't go off if there's a freeze up or, or it gets really cold. But I was just looking at this like, it's really unusual to have a wet fire protection system covering a database. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Um, yeah, and we had a situation where it wasn't a sprinkler, but it was a leaky pipe. So that actually raises a question of, possibly reviewing the system and updating parts of it to be some form of gas or other element that is less destructive but as effective. Right now, and so what I was thinking is uh, in certain areas where key infrastructure is, right? So come up with a limited use, maybe, I mean, I could imagine where the servers are, a top umbrella effectively, so you don't get water pouring down, plus hail on or whatever it is that they use. So I guess the main point is probably for the next go round we look at a review of our system. So so the two servers actually do have corrugated plastic over the top of them. They're in those the cage over there and the cage over here. And so they do have corrugated plastic. So if if a sprinkler went off, I think that the servers themselves would probably be protected. The the rest of the computers would not. Um, but I 
And again, we lease this space, so it was part of the building to do as much as we can. And um, we need to have contingency plans as well. Yeah, at least my stomach turned a little. Okay, thank you, Ken. Anything else? So we also have the mandate of ethics under this um, committee. Uh, there isn't anything right now, but uh, Mr. Cross and I had a very interesting conversation. You might like to talk about this a little bit what, yeah, at, at our visit to the ethics board. And oh. it, it's interesting, their conversation with them. Some of them have a very, very intense read of what disclosure requirements are. The, you know, one of them suggested that I, because I have a real estate license, anytime there's a zoning change, should make a disclosure that I have a real estate license. It's like, what are you talking about? It is not a personal, specific, professional, financial interest if there's a land use change. And so, to me, that conversation highlighted that at some point we'll have to return again with a clear eyed look at the ethics code and think through that. I'm not suggesting a project at this point. There's nothing broken. Don't need to fix it. But it was a very enlightening conversation in which we have a difference of opinion on what constitutes the requirement to disclose. So. Yes. <laughs> really weird. Really intense. Like, I mean, we could spend 10 minutes before every agenda item making disclosures if that's the case. Yeah, I was going to ask you that last night. Yeah, it, it got really awkward because it got down to a rabbit hole to where it was almost as if, do we have to disclose that we own homes when we're making policies that affect property taxes? Because if you're trying to lower taxes, could you argue that's benefiting you financially? Like, it was a really a strange conversation they had with how much they would consider something to be a conflict of interest. And of course, in my conversation was, you know, if you, you can't live in this community and not have a conflict of interest on anything that you do. The only people who would not have a conflict of interest are people who've never lived here, don't work here, and don't have anything to do with the city. You'd have to ship people in from Wasilla. <laughs> and even then. <laughs> and even then, they might be questionable. Yeah. So. I, I'm sorry, I think I would argue that you guys fill out financial disclosures annually from for APOC, and that's all listed online. So, so I would argue that you have disclosed in a public place financial interest in things, whether it be homes or loans or right, income. The argument back to that so. is, well, you have a house or you list and sell houses. Maybe you need to make a disclosure because you're going from R4 to R3 and a general standard across the city. It's like, well, way, 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 way too close. Mr. Gates. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Constant. Uh, just so I can take this out of context, do you say that's a written opinion from the ethics no. board? It was just a dialogue at their meeting. And nothing that they officially like produced is already. Not yet. I'm just okay. waiting for some recommendation to come forward. But yeah, it was kind of related to a different matter, but the conversation was free flowing. So um, other matters came up in the conversation trying to get to what it means to have a substantial personal and financial interest. And it also wasn't something that they voted on in terms of voting on some issue for the report disclosures. Um, now, again, it was a separate matter that we don't need to get into okay. that they were discussing. They may have or may have not yet taken action on, but um, it was a conversation that there was interest by members in having further discussion about what does this mean. I can talk to you something. I'm not shy. Right. So, uh, but again, it was on a matter that's very specific and unrelated to the broader conversation. I'll, I'll come straight forward. So there was an ethics complaint against me that because I have a real estate license, I shouldn't be working on any zoning or housing issues. And that that could be seen as a direct conflict. And so, even my even my service on the platting board was a conflict. And so the question is, well, then how do you find people that have no? Your only option is people who've never served in the housing industry and have no housing knowledge serving on housing policy. Right. And then at what point does that, you know? But that's what it was about. It was very interesting the the rabbit trails they went down during the conversation. You also swore an oath to office to uphold them. Yeah, so it just highlighted to me that there's still some uncertainty or gray in the space between what is written, what is understood. And so I imagine at some point that will be coming for some project. But I'm not putting it on the table now. I'm not listing something as new or unfinished business. I'm just having an open conversation about, hey, this happened. 
it probably at some time in the not too, too distant future, this matter will arise in a thoughtful and deliberative manner. Anyone else? Ms. Brock. So if we're talking about the ethics portion, you know, there's the financial part, but also, like, if you're too close to an issue, um, we've had several emails about last night, and, um, and maybe we need to discuss that as well. You know, uh, there's a feeling that certain people get to speak more than others, and, yeah, I, I don't know, but I feel like at times some of us do have a exceptional closeness to an issue that maybe, I don't know how that works, you put yourself out of a debate on something when... No, a member doesn't have the right to exclude themselves from debate, but another member could make a comment or make a motion that I believe this member has a conflict, a personal, a substantial personal or financial interest, and then the conversation begins at the dais. A member could say, Mr. Chair, point of order, I believe X, Y, and Z. The chair would then rule, then it would go to the body to decide. But I can't recall, except for last night on an action of a supermajority of the assembly, happened once before recently, that any member has not been granted the authority to speak under an item of business, except for if they've already spoken twice. And so uh, I would welcome pointing out some specific um, examples, maybe contemporaneous, when it seems like somebody is being granted more rights than another on the dais, because I, I work really hard to make sure everybody's rights are respected. Go ahead. So I think it was a public, um, what, what I'm thinking of is a public um, complaint, and their, their avenue is where? Um, if they feel like they're unfairly being treated in their um, interactions, is this their venue, the Ethics Committee? Do they go to... No, but they could if they believe some form of violation of the code, just go to the Ethics Board and make a complaint. Okay. And so that would be the avenue. Or they can always stay at the end, audience participation, and speak for three minutes on any matter that they want. And so if it's in reference to a couple of emails we receive, I welcome that because I have a different opinion. Okay. Thanks. And I will stand on that. Mr. Gates. Um, since Ms. Bronga asked what's the public's avenue, they think there's some ethical violations and we're going to get a or whatever. Um, our code says for the ethics board, any adult resident of municipality may file a complaint to which the public servants conduct violates the code of ethics. And that's in 150, 160. That's probably why the ethics board is very busy and active board. <laughs> and so they filter those out. And you know, if, if you, know, you need to refer people that are interacting with you know, to the ethics board, that might be the way to end their I guess, interaction, including the open and the kind of ethical. Just come back and find a complaint. Appreciate that. Mr. Myers. So I wasn't going to bring it up, but since I've got Dean's attention and yours, um, I represent Cook Inlet Housing. I don't think that's a, a, an issue to anybody. I mean, I think everybody's probably pretty aware of that. But every time Tyler writes a letter in support of a uh, ordinance or zoning change, do I have to disclose that? Because it doesn't affect the particular subdivision I'm working on. Um, so if you were to ask the ethics board, they would say disclose, disclose, disclose. And by making a disclosure, you provide for yourself a shield. That's one thing. Disclosure itself, if the members hear it and nobody objects, is a shield for you. And so um, I would argue that generally speaking, it is better to disclose if there is a specific connection. Mm -hmm. However, a letter from a member of the public opining on a matter does not make the matter a, a conflict because it's not Cook Inlet's business. It's in much the same way if an assembly member owns a house, they don't have a conflict if we're dealing with zoning codes and they say, I support this issue. And so you want to think about all of those elements when you make a disclosure that, it, you know, if it was a project that Cook Inlet was implementing and we were supporting, I would say absolutely you should disclose that. Um, but I thought if, about it going, and I don't right. have a personal or financial right. 
a conflict. Yeah. But, and so also, to take it one step further out, where I think you would still want to make a disclosure would be if Cook Inlet has a matter of business and you aren't involved in it, it's not a property you manage, I would still argue you should disclose that because that connection is close enough then the members can weigh the question. And so, but if it's Cook Inlet writing a letter in support of Project X, Y, or Z that they're not funded or supported by, that I think gets to the point where it's so far afield that it's not such a big deal. However, if you have any pangs in the back of your mind, disclose, disclose, disclose for the disclosure, and the member's evaluation of that disclosure is your shield. Mr. Gates? Any addition? Um, well, I was going to mention that we do have a city ethics officer, and I was trying to remember the name. Paul. Um, the rule has changed, I guess, so I'm now giving the blank right now. Air Vosti. It, yeah. Yes. Yes. Lost it. Paul. Paul yes. And so, um, Mr. Arvasti, if I'm saying his name right, is the resource for, I guess, assembly members or other public officials to go to for some quick informal uh, dialogue about what you disclose and when. And sometimes it's very helpful because they'll have experience addressing issues frequently and know the exact questions they need to know about their situation and give some advice if you start going for them. Depending on who's in that role. Especially to do rather than trying to get ethics advice here and come to me. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just giving you practical advice. But depending on who is in that role, and that, that's general advice, not specific advice. If you have a specific question, always better to, to get the advice where you feel like it, it's beneficial. The ethics officer at times has been willing to opine and at times has not been willing because they just decide it's not within the purview of their work or they don't have the time. And so you can't necessarily rely upon it being available to you. But one thing you can always rely upon is the assembly, when you say, I want to make a disclosure, will hear you, period, full stop. It will always be heard. Yes, and you can always also um, ask. So from Mr. Horowitz, will be. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we see some of the frequent issues that are easy to answer. Everyone's sure of me against this university. And it might be at some point we start biting in here for these conversations. Or he gave a little flavor of <clears throat> where the questions are in real time with members separate from the ethics board. And then uh, it can be maybe a little less confounding for him trying to balance the interests of the question. So um, we might want to do that maybe on a semi annual basis or something along those lines. So I just have a question with. Mr. Avasti recently named as the municipal ethics officer. I thought we didn't have one. I thought that we had a municipal attorney who advised the ethics board, and I thought that was Megan. So there's a little bit of interesting kind of layers there, but I know Paul sits in on all of the ethics board meetings, and so he's essentially practicing for the board. So that's a good question. We can get clarification. Right. I know that in the past there was an ethics officer. I thought it was Paul. Maybe it's not Paul. We'll figure that out. It's, I mean, Megan Carmichael's last day with Ms. Valde was last Friday. Ooh, got it. Thank Paul Gravosti actually does not sit in the municipal attorney's office. Right. He sits under the municipal attorney's office, but he's our administrative hearing officer. Right. And it was established that there is an accomplice between wearing the two hats. Um, hold on. And, and Je fact, Jessica, hold on. I'm going to just say that. Um, uh, in the audience and not on the microphone, Ms. Willoughby just said, and I'll do my best to capture it for the record, that um, Ms. Carmichael is no longer with the Muni as of last week, and so uh, there's some change along the lines that Mr. Urbosti does not work for the municipal attorney as a municipal attorney, but is in fact the administrative hearing officer. There has been a determination made that he does not have a conflict in serving in both of those capacities, and so I think that's where capturing the essence of what you set up, if there's anything. So we'll figure that out. It's a good question. Sure. Thank you. And Dean, maybe we'll kind of by email figure out who they have identified. Okay. Thanks. All right, so that's a little flight of fancy down the ethics side of the Ethics and Election Committee. Any other matters? Oops. No? Okay. Very good. Thanks. And I guess we'll be adjourned. 
Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Before we hear audience participation, there's a member of the public. Would you like to speak? Okay, she says no. So, <laughs> hearing and seeing no other members of the public, now we are adjourned.